Thanks for coming in. My name is Florian Esra. I'm an ISB board member, and I'm delighted to have a panel now with some distinguished guests here on how we should be accelerating digital IFRS accounting. And we have a interesting cross-section of um, experience here, and I would suggest let's do a quick introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Revati Ramanan. I manage development of guidance resources at XPL International. So of other things that I do uh, there, I love exploring how XPL data can be analyzed. Yeah, I think that was, brings me to this panel. Hi, I'm Lou Roman. I'm with Deloitte in the US and I work on uh, XPL advisory and assurance services. I've been in, uh, worked for a service provider previously doing XPL tagging and primarily for the SEC, but also other jurisdictions. I've been an expert for uh, more than 10, maybe 15 years. Thank you. I'm Marc Rouillet from Corporatings. I'm the CTO. Uh, we are a data provider. We collect uh, reports from all around the world and try to make them available while also providing some analysis capabilities uh, around the text that's contained within it, but also working a lot on the relations between the data. Thank you very much. And as you can see, we have very different perspectives on this. And I think um, one of the things that we should be thinking about when we talk about digital reporting is actually how much headway we have already made over the last several decades. So let's start on a positive note and talk about what we think is working very well currently in our ecosystem. And Rivati, you want to start? Maybe. So one thing we did at XBI International uh, last year was to create a demonstration dashboard using 3,000 plus uh, 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 European single electronic uh, format inline XBI reports. So my, my comments in this panel would be primarily around the experience of creating that uh, uh, demo dashboard. So first thing, even though the ESIF uh, reports are just the, the face financials that are uh, detailed tag, the, the, the data is used. One, the data can be used to create macro analysis. Say, say you want to understand profit growth across companies or you want to spot outliers in effective tax rates. So that face financial tag data is useful to, to come out with you know, macro analysis like that. Second, you know, that digital data can be used to understand how companies disclose or how they have applied the, the standards. Uh, third, the third possibility that I'm very excited about is how the impressive text analytics libraries can be applied to narrative disclosures uh, to discover patterns that are not easy to spot when you manually go through the reports. So let me uh, give you an example. I was looking at impairment losses, the the notes, the, the narrative part of the notes. And I happen to apply this entity recognition library. So what it does, it, it kind of separates out the text that is standard text, uh, standard default text that you find in every report, and, and the disclosure that have something interesting, you know, that have probably uh, has a mention of, of an acquisition or it has a mention of an event, a date. So this this library kind of helps you to segregate text that, that should be interesting for you. So, so this is an example of how uh, text analytics can be applied to a digitally tagged disclosure. The, the bottom line is, um, you know, the, the tagged digital data is has analytical value and could be used for multiple purposes. So I think that's something good that is happening. Yeah. Sure. Um, what I was thinking about was the XBRL program at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission is, a, is an example of a rather robust program that has been in place for a while that is working. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's the, the filers that submit information don't do that just annually. Most all of them are required to do it quarterly. So there's quarterly submissions and they're at, they're tagged at quite a detailed level. The SEC has a requirement that each amount in the notes or any table 
must be tagged separately. And therefore, there's a lot of detail coming in. And then you add to that, the uh, SEC has the Edgar platform, and on there, all the data comes into that, and it's publicly accessible um, as soon as it's filed. So um, I know that program has been going on for 10 years, so they've had a chance to, to get everything rolling. But uh, the SEC brings new requirements frequently, and five years ago, they added inline XBRL requirement as well. So um, that, that program has the ability to accept information on a quarterly basis in a detailed level and then make it accessible. So it's working from that point. Mark? Thank you. So yeah, I, I, will, um, I will say my European point of view. So in Europe, uh, we've made great progress in the past few years uh, because of the new regulation and it's been applied uh, very well, right? All companies that were supposed to create the new inline XBL reports do so. And if we want to compare to what we had two or three years ago, uh, when we collected reports, right, during the most intense periods of reporting, usually we had to choose and prioritize uh, which companies we worked on first. And usually it was the, the biggest uh, companies first. And the reason for that was not just that the bigger companies were more, more interesting for end users, but also that uh, smaller companies had more exotic presentation of their financial statements. So it was more work for us to really understand what their financial statements meant, but also that many of these reports were only available in uh, the home language of the company. So not English and not any language we were familiar with. So it took a lot of time to, to work on them. And so the publication of the detailed data was, was quite delayed. So now we're able to collect the, the data and make it available to end users in a matter of minutes but we also have a much better understanding of which data it is actually uh, that is within the statements, right? So great progress on that side. But there were also some unexpected uh, gains from applying inline XBRL to these reports, which is it also makes the reports more understandable for human uh, users, right? Before with the PDF, people were only concerned when judging whether the data was fine with reading the data and then that was it, right? But end users of the data wanted to read the PDF and get the data extracted into their own analysis tool. And there were many PDFs uh, for which if you were trying to copy paste a table, you would just get one line of text that was not usable. You had some specific fonts that could not be copy pasted. So just because inline XBRL is a format that is supposed to be extracted into plain XBRL, uh, auditors, issuers, and regulators now pay attention to whether data can actually be extracted and put in, into the tools that are actually uh, expected to use data. So even for uh, traditional users of financial statements, that has been a great progress. Thank you. So I, yeah, I think I used to be an investor and I think accessibility of data particularly in the US but then the increasing availability in, in Europe is obviously is something that is very important because it's basically the starting point. But I think what I think is most interesting is that we're seeing the first steps of increased analytics on top of these reporting formats, which then create the real value, right? Just having data is good, but data by itself isn't information yet. You need the analytics to actually create information. And I think this is interesting how far we have progressed on this in this process already. But I think we all can agree, and this is why we're here, that we're probably not there where we would want to be, right? So, Mark, let's start at this side. What do you see as the key pain points that we're experiencing? Right. While the documents have made great improvements, uh, one of the biggest issues we have as data providers is collecting the reports in the first, uh, right, in the first place. Um, we have a, a framework in Europe where each uh, member state has its own um, distribution portals, or what they call an OAM, and the OAMs are not held to the same standard as what our end users or the, us data providers do, right? So uh, we, we could not, for instance, uh, not provide data for uh, days at a time, but that's what we see at OAMs, right? We have, we have uh, OAMs that are unavailable for weeks. We have some of them where 
we cannot retrieve any file that is over 30 megabytes, right? Because the server will, will have a, uh, an issue or an anomaly. We have ones um, where, for instance, we only get part of the report, right? They just give us the, the uh, HTML, uh, but not the taxonomy that's behind it. We have OAMs uh, where you have to pay if you want to download more than three reports. Um, we have some of them that actually make the reports available weeks after they've been submitted. And then we have also portals that uh, may delete reports or uh, update amended versions of the reports without giving us any notification, right? So, so all of these are really issues because we cannot afford to give that uh, sort of issues back to our users. So uh, we need to rehost all data and also make sure that we um, develop ways to get around this kind of issues. And we do that, but of course, the what, what should be available is that all users, even the, the, the simple investor that just wants to get his little file and, and use it, uh, doesn't have to deal with that sort of uh, challenges, right? And there are also is other issues around infrastructure that we have that are around the legal infrastructure. So in Europe, detail tagging is only mandatory for uh, the primary financial statements. And, and one of the issues we have is there is no strict definition of what goes into these primary statements, right? The, the, the IFRS define uh, what data must be reported, but there is often a lot of leeway on, about whether you put that information within the financial statements or within the notes. And we see some extremes, right? We see some companies whose cash flow statements uh, on the operational part is just the total and everything else is within the notes. Users need to know reliably what can they can expect to, to do with the digital data. And more generally speaking, uh, they need to access everything within the notes because by definition, what is within the financial statements is decision useful, right? So, uh, I understand why uh, in Europe we've had um, not de full detail tagging from the beginning, right? Because this has its own issues, but I'm sure some middle ground can be can be found, right? Uh, but uh, I don't have full experience with uh, engaging with a lot of stakeholders that do full detail tagging, but probably some things can be done. <clears throat> Let me pick up on that point, and that's a good point you're talking about detail tagging of the information in the notes. Um, I've had a lot of experience with that. And there are definite pros and cons to should detailed information within the notes be tagged or not. On the con side, um, for the issuers, there is a noticeable increase in the workload to do detailed tagging of the notes. And be aware and watch out uh, the the first year of doing that is probably is the most uh, time consuming. Second year, third year is not quite so much, but that first year mapping the taxonomy to those detailed notes. And of course, it depends on the extent to which the regulator requires a lot or less items to be tagged within the notes. But um, that first year can be uh, quite a bit of work. M most everybody will advise that you should uh, do a dry run before year end to to get a lot of the heavy lifting out of the way. Uh, I think that was the same with the ESEF uh, primary statements as well. So keep that in mind and, and beware of that. Um, another con that I can think of is there's a higher rate of extensions in the notes to the financial statements than there is to the primary financial statements. So just be aware of that and, and be ready for that. But also, um, there can be anchoring of those extensions, which that even adds more time to to what's going on. So another, that's just another con to think about, and it depends on what the regulator does as well. Um, on the pro side, if the, the notes and the information in the notes is integral to the financial statements, okay, given that, the detailed tagging provides tag data that actually is better reflective of what the standard setter says you must disclose. So there's a much better matching between here's what I should disclose according to the standard setter and here's what is tagged in the financial statements. Um, 
it's a big plus, a big pro for the users of the financial statements that want to get to that more detailed information. And I'm not just talking about analysts and investors. I'm also talking about uh, regulators will use that detailed information, um, standard setters, and then also issuers can use that information to maybe compare themselves to other companies. Um, and then lastly, I think a, a pro is that it, it's something that is feasible as evidenced by an example is the SEC's program. Um, companies are providing quarterly information um, and they're doing it in a detailed manner. And guess what? They're doing it on time. They, they, file, they file that detailed information at the same time they submit their traditional financial statements. So, so even though I said that, you know, this uh, data is analytically useful, there were a few challenges that I uh, came across when analyzing uh, IFRS digital uh, uh, tag reports. Now, one of them was not all companies using the same high-level tags or the subtotals. Um, so let me give you an example. If I have to calculate, say, a debt equity ratio, what I need, I need liabilities, I need equity. You know, these two tags are what I need. But in, in the sample that I had, I found out that 40% of the companies didn't didn't have a tag for liabilities because you know they, they didn't disclose the liability total separately, which is not something you know uh, uh, not compliant with IFRS. But you know that is how their presentation format has been. So now when when you do not have a high level tag, then then it is not straightforward that you arrive at a, a, a ratio as simple as debt equity. Then you go into components of liability to understand what the total is. Uh, Another example is if you want to calculate operating profit. Now, not all companies report operating profit. So now these kind of inconsistent or different patterns in reporting, even at the face financial kind of hampers what you could do with, uh, you know, at a macro, uh, macro level. Uh, there's one more technical issue as to using a specific tag or a generic tag, like, you would expect all uh, reports to have a tag called as profit and loss, you know. You, but not all companies use that tag. They, they, you know, for companies that have, say, no minority interest, you know, they tend to use a tag called profit loss, uh, uh, profit and loss to owners of parent, you know, which is fine, you know, which is not, which is not wrong. But you know, they they tend to choose a very specific tag. Now these difference in tagging or or difference in the way they present their face financial you know definitely hampers how how you can analyze uh, uh the, the statements you know here i'm not even talking about extension it is it is the same base taxonomy tags that have been used but how different presentation impacts or hampers uh, the analysis um one more uh, parameter to consider is which industry the the company belongs to uh, now, now that that is important. Say uh, to categorize ratio. Uh, say you have a debt equity ratio or you have a interest coverage ratio. It is important to understand if the company is having finance as their main business because you know how how debt equity for a banking company is very different from from a manufacturing company. Now that information is not currently available in in the ESF report. What do you do? Do you have proxies for that? may not be able. so you know that kind of having the same threshold for all company distorts the big picture so that that is something i found that uh, was missing when i was analyzing industry codes or some kind of industry classification would have been better of course the third one is extension i think we all know uh, you know the challenges that extensions or entity specific disclosures bring to analysis of course you know we we know they are they are necessary. There is no easy fix. But in the ESIF context, you know what I think is the anchoring is is helping to understand uh, to understand what the extensions are and how they relate to the base taxonomy elements. Of course, you know we we uh, kind of exploring how those anchoring relationships could be built back in, into the analytical model. Yeah, these were few challenges in my exercise. Thank you very much. So when, when I think of our ecosystem, I think of it as, as a value chain of actors. And it 
and to be honest, it starts with us as standard setters. The digital report is only as comparable as the standard that is underlying it. So I think it's upon us as standard setters to write good standards that provide a good basis for digital reporting. And that's, then it's on preparers and data services, uh, and not uh, service providers, preparers and service providers to actually do the work, go through the financial statement, do the tagging, do it correctly, and faithful representation, all that. The data aggregators to get the data, and in the end, to the software providers, whatever, to have the analytical layers on top. Right? I think there's there's a whole value chain within our ecosystem where each and every one needs to play their own parts. Otherwise, it will not work, including national governments and regulators. So the question to the panel then is, if you would be ruler of the world for one day, let's say, and only in digital reporting, <laughs> <laughs> You know, I can wish for world peace, but um, but just in digital reporting, what will be the one thing you would like to change? And let's start with Ravatine again. Okay. Uh, I think one uh, project that IFIS Foundation is doing, and I'm looking forward to it, is the primary phase financial uh, project, which, you know, focuses on comparability and increasing the understanding you know if i was ruler of the world i would have kind of uh, you know fast tracked that project <laughs> okay so uh, that that project is uh, you know as i understand will uh, solve a lot of challenges that i was talking about you know and having those high level to some some okay okay <laughs> some disclaimers coming there yeah <laughs> okay yeah 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 so yeah, that that uh, that that's what I would do. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, I think if I had that kind of power, I would uh, first and foremost give uh, more funding to regulators to get their own expert staff. Uh, I think, and from the beginning, right before even the implementation of the project, uh, regulators have to create specifications, but they also have to collect feedback. They have to be able to answer questions with confidence. They have to be able to update their specifications. Uh, and they also have to be able to enforce the specifications. And you cannot do that with the best expertise in the field, right? You are going to have to tell to issuers that they make mistakes or you have to be able to, uh, to be to able to handle very specific questions on specific cases, right? And that's not been the case in Europe. Uh, we've had a lot of work that had to be done by all kinds of stakeholders to figure out what the specifications actually meant and how to handle specific cases. And I think I've seen hundreds of uh, people trying to really reinvent the wheel because they had to do so, right? I've seen uh, software providers really trying, some of them, right, trying to build uh, reports uh, as if they were the first IFS digital reports and sometimes as if they were the first inline expert reports, right? Because they didn't have the guidance and no one they could really rely on when the ones responsible for eventually judging whether things were done well was the regulator. So really uh, what I would wish for is more expert staff and the founding, of course, to do so uh, for the regulators. And when I mean staff, I really mean internal uh, uh, long-term staff rather than, you know, what, what is usually done, which is uh, relying on consultants because consultants can really help you make the first round of specifications, but they aren't there to do all the rest. And handling uh, a, a specification regulation or standards is a really a long-term job, right? At the foundation, they have really expert staff, and I think we can see how well that works. And I think even at this conference, we'll get some testimony from other regulators that really uh, gained expertise. I think we have a, a testimony from Korea today, and I think really that's what's needed. If I were a ruler for that point in time, I'd change from what one thing do you want to what multiple things do I want. So I'll do that right now. Um, okay. One thing, I, one thing I can think of is 
there's a few things. One, it would be um, appropriate validations, meaning automated rules that are run. Sure, there's spec 2.1. You can run rules on that. You can run them on the filer manual like the ESEF reporting manual or the Edgar filer manual. But then there's additional things you can do, um, accounting relationships and business correlations that are within the tagging. Um, XPRL US has a data quality committee that creates those types of rules. And IFRS formula is a similar thing. So even make those you know more important. Uh, another thing would be appropriate um, enforcement by the regulators. Uh, another thing would be appropriate um, level of tagging. So, you know, a healthy balance between what the users want and what the issuers can actually provide in, in a reasonable time frame. And then the last thing I'm thinking about right now is communication. Um, great communication between all the parties involved, which is the regulator, the issuer, the standard setter, then the, the users like the investors and the analysts, as well as the service providers, they have a part in it, and then the auditors as well. Yeah, I, that's actually a great closing word, I would have said, because this is why we're here, right? I think trying to get all the people from all these different areas of expertise together and try to have a chat. Um, so we're a little bit ahead of time. Cognizant that it's between this and lunch, right? Does anybody have a question for the panel? Oh, yes. So, okay. No lunch then. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's start with this question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for all the wisdom. We think that you've said. Um, when we talk about comparability, we often mean between companies, right, today. Um, and I'd like to ask something about the comparability through time. Because uh, as, you, as you said, uh, the standards uh, basically are the groundwork for everything, but they evolve. Um, and I have three examples. For example, um, some of the types, like in the US types taxonomy, are created because they are not standardized yet. Then they make their way into the type registry uh, and then are slowly replaced. Uh, another aspect is the extensible new, uh, enumerations that went from version 1 to uh, version 2. Uh, and there were, even before dimensions were invented, there was a tuples. So there's very old filings with tuples. Uh, how do we deal with all of this legacy? Uh, what is, I, I'd like to understand the current status. Do the, are they converted in some way to the newer formats? Or is anything done? Or do we just no longer analyze the old one? Thank you. Yeah, let me let me just quickly start from the standard setter perspective and then I'll hand over to Mark. I think in the development of standards and the subsequent taxonomy, um, this is a topic which we come which comes up again and again and again. And we try to handle it as judiciously as possible. But obviously, trying to maintain something that is not required or used anymore, or which is an improvement, obviously is a cost burden for preparers, right? And so that's sort of the type of discussion when we say within a standard, we want a prospective or a retrospective type of application. Retrospective would at least gives you a few years backward compatibility. But it's really one of those trade-offs Jatin talked about earlier, right? which also is true for just setting accounting standards, there's a cost benefit. And I don't think there's, there's the end. So it's just something we will have to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis as we work through the standards and then subsequent iterations of the taxon. Thank you for the question. And my answer is going to be actually, uh, usually uh, technology changes and even changes to the standards catch up to what users do. So. Uh, we've been classifying uh, text statements into Booleans and categories for years. So usually when it comes uh, to us, it's just that we don't have to do this work manually anymore, but everything that is going to become a Boolean in the new version of Saxony is already a Boolean to us, right? So uh, we don't have to, we don't stop analyzing all, all the ones. We just uh, stop having to work on them anymore. So. It, it's very rare, rare that uh, the foundation or the regulators do things that were not requested by some part by users, right? So usually it's not extra work or an inconvenience for us that there is any change. It's really 
something that we appreciate. All right, I'd like everyone to thank the panel um, for the discussion today, and we have speaker gifts for each of them.